Okay, I think we should be live now. I'm Greg Salmieri, this time in Jersey City where I live with Ben Bayer. And this is a supplemental episode to the Atlas Project Live. As you guys know, we go live every week to discuss the novel. And uh, we are up to part one, chapter six, the non-commercial. We had a discussion of that, the... Um, that on Tuesday, and there were some leftover issues, so we wanted to go on and discuss it tonight and uh, see, you know, you guys can join us online to discuss it with us, and we'll also open discussion up to anything, uh, you know, anything up to where we are with the novel. That's up through chapter 1-6. Of course, online uh, on the Facebook comment thread, we're already discussing uh, part 1, chapter 7, and we will, you know, commence with an episode on, on that on, uh, on Tuesday. All right, Ben, do you have confirmation that people in the world are hearing us? It looks like there are 16 viewers on now. Um, I haven't seen any comments yet. I'm trying to use the new comment viewer utility that we've got, and uh, uh, I'm not sure yet if any comments have come through. If people can, um, would like to I can like see us comment. live. Yeah, I'm pretty sure we're live. I don't know if the comments are working. So if somebody ends commenting that you can hear us, and Robert is, and now, okay. ah, good, they are coming over in the new utility. So the new utility works well. It's also got some um, places where we could view the number of visitors and reactions, but those uh, those seem like it's just mock-up data for now. Thanks, uh, thanks, Lana, for saying you could hear us, and are our volumes good? Uh, How is I my volume? Are, I, it looks from my level meter is good. Uh, and so I think we should be all right. So what shall we talk about? Well, one thing that we wanted to talk about from the end of last time is we didn't get to say much about what the title of the chapter meant. The title is the non-commercial. So I thought I might start out by saying a couple of uh, words about that, making a suggestion or two. And um, and my mother says the volume's good. Thanks, Mom. Uh, and Rachel says it's good. Uh, so I might say a few words about what I think the significance of the chapter title to be. And then uh, Ben has some really interesting thoughts, uh, kind of, I guess you call them comparative philosophy or comparative history thoughts. Um, I'm not sure what you call the genre of them. Anyway, some very interesting thoughts on the significance of, of what uh, Reardon thinks as he looks out the window that he didn't get a chance to to share on Tuesday. So he'll I hope he'll share that with us now. And uh, then we have a few other kind of leftover topics from the discussion board, and I hope you'll bring up some topics, guys, on Facebook Live, since we don't have our live audiences with us, or our live audience with us tonight. So the chapter title is The Non-Commercial, and I think you can get a, a sense of what's meant by that from the very first scene of the chapter, where Reardon is struggling, uh, he knows he ought to go, or he thinks he ought to go to this party, he thinks he owes it to his family, and he just can't uh, can't quite bring himself to do it at first. And there's the question of uh, why this is. And Ben, uh, in discussing that, focused on that it was perplexing to Reardon that uh, his desire didn't follow his, his reason, uh, his beliefs about what he should do in this case, as for Reardon, it normally does. Normally, if Reardon uh, thinks he should do something, uh, he also feels the desire to do it, but not on this occasion. And uh, Reardon wonders why that is, thinks that's the formula of corruption. And we talked a lot about that uh, and the, the issue of the relation between reason and emotion. Maybe we'll come back to that later. Some people on, the, on Facebook said they wanted to. But Focus for a moment not on the idea of a conflict that Reardon's in, but what the conflict's over. And it's that he thinks he owes his family, and Lillian in particular, some kind of life unrelated to business, right? He feels like he's the practitioner of some dark religion, or he has some guilty secret that he loves business. And if you're not supposed to talk about business in public, you should have things that are unrelated to business. His family life should be unrelated to business. He should have friendships unrelated to business. He should go to this party and uh, give his family what he owes them and has been neglecting them, namely uh, some non-business time, some non-commercial uh, endeavor, right? And I think the party is meant to give us a sense of what what it is that's opposed to business, what it is that Reardon 
thinks he owes his family and why he can't really feel uh, serious that he owes it to them or feel like he ought to give it to them, even though he thinks he should. What is the nature of this non-commercial thing? And part of what's happening is he's reflecting on it, right? Lillian wants something from Reardon. Which she, there's some reason she stays with him. He doesn't know what it is. There's some kind of claim she has on him. So there's something she wants from him. Uh, he doesn't know or understand what it is. All we know is that it's something non-material, non-commercial, unrelated to business, uh, unlike the kinds of things that Reardon is normally concerned with. Well, what is that? And I think this chapter is supposed to make us reflect on what is this non-commercial thing Lillian wants? What is the alternative to Reardon's business-focused way of being, where it's not just that he's always thinking about literally his business, though he very often is, but he has a kind of business-centric mindset. And uh, what's the opposite to that that his family wants of him? So that's, that's what I interpret it as being. Ben, do you have any thoughts on that? Or anyone on the comments also, if they want to come in? I don't see any new comments on this popping up just yet, but um, one question that I've seen people ask in connection with this is about, I'm getting just a tiny little echo, uh, is it, so I think some readers are curious about whether uh, someone like Lillian is really being sincere when she says that she wants something non-commercial because uh, you do see her uh, otherwise portrayed as, as being in fact interested in what at least looked to be kind of outwardly materialistic concerns like the fact that uh, she prefers the uh, the diamond uh, uh, bracelet to the, the bracelet of reared metal. Uh, uh, beyond that, there's also the, the wider fact that a lot of her friends at the party, uh, even while they uh, talk about <clears throat> uh, being interested in non-commercial concerns themselves, we see them uh, constantly eating hors d'oeuvres and canapes and uh, en uh, enjoying the uh, amenities of Reardon's uh, home. And so is, is there some uh, contradiction in what they're saying? Are they hypocrites? Or is there something uh, else going on? here? Yeah, I think that's a good, a good question. I mean, there's, there's mixed evidence on this, right? Because these people are, as you put it, enjoying Reardon's hors d'oeuvres and the comforts of his home. And uh, um, Val Fewbank's upset that his novels don't sell like soap and so forth. So they, they do want some kind of material goods and material success. On the other hand, uh, Reardon thinks, and so far the evidence we have is right, that, that she, Lillian is indifferent to the kind of extravagance that, um, that Reardon can afford her, right? I mean, so she's not living sort of like somebody with no money, but she had money before she married him. Uh, it doesn't seem like she married him for his money. He's, she's not living, they're not living at, you know, up to their means, and she's not pushing them to. Um, Robert notes that uh, Lillian tells Reardon about the anniversary date back in, in Chapter 2. It's purely non-commercial. And yes, I think this is a, a flashback to that. The party's been described as non-commercial, and now we're seeing what it is that Lillian said was purely non-commercial. Um, so Lillian isn't... Um, she's not extravagant, at any rate. And Philip, too, right... Uh, uh, someone says, you know, the, if the equal of opportunity, Equalization of Opportunity Bill passes, it'll trim the hors d'oeuvres bill around here. And Philip's response is, you know, what would make you think that I'd be opposed to that, right? So Philip's standard of living might be decreased if, Reardon, uh, if Reardon's business has problems. But Philip, uh, that doesn't make Philip change his mind or not want to do it. So even if... Um, it might be true that in some sense they want the money or the fruits of Reardon's labor. Uh, it doesn't seem like they, they, they are not bothered by things that will actually harm his business, even if they'll actually harm their standard of living, at least so far as it seems from what we can tell. Uh, uh, Judy, Judy says Lee Judy wants to be seen as high society. Oh, go ahead, Ben. Well, you're looking at the same comment that I was looking at, but... Uh, Judy thinks that Lillian wants to be seen as high society, looked up to by those she invited to her party. 
is that the major motive here? Is that the is that a commercial motive or is that a non-commercial motive? If it if that is indeed her motive, or if it's not that, what what else could it be? Um, I don't think we're going to get an answer to that question in this chapter, but uh, we do see some data we can use to help answer the question. Yeah, I think that's right. Also, I'm I cut the, I'm adjusting my camera a bit, trying to get see what the best uh, shot is, so that I could be looking at the right places uh, and still have my eyes in the screen some of the time. Um, yeah, uh, the other aspect of the non-commercial, uh, Judy says social, uh, the other aspect of the non-commercial theme that I, I think we should notice, and we did talk a little bit about this on Tuesday, is uh, I think Lillian's friends are meant to represent this non-commercial mentality, right? And so what are Lillian's friends interested in, right? Balf Eubank is a writer. He's a writer who no one reads his books. They sell some very small number of copies. And, uh, and, and why? Well, they're, they're not interesting. And he proposes a law whereby only, you know, a couple of thousand, 10,000 or something copies of a book could ever be sold. And the, the woman in the white dress, the sort of audience avatar of a, of a sort of more honest or sensible person, uh, earnest person responds, well, what if, you know, people want to read a book, if it has a good plot, and because it has such a good plot, a lot of people want to read it. And, uh, and her, uh, his response is, you know, well, plot, a couple, two points, right? One, that um, that's the num no, more, no book needs more than 10,000 readers, but also that uh, he puts down plot, right? It's, uh, 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 as he puts down plot. But plot is the kind of thing that people like in books, right? Uh, a, what makes a book commercial, that is what makes people want to buy and read it, is that it has a plot. Uh, or people get excited and interested in the story. And he wants literature that lacks the very aspect that makes people like it. We talked about this being nihilistic before, but, but let's think of it now from a commercial perspective. He wants to get rid of the very aspect of, of a story that makes them valuable to people and therefore that makes it possible to sell them. And likewise, uh, Simon Pritchett wants to get rid of logic in philosophy, which is the... And, uh, Wants to get uh, wants to make the point that it's not the job of philosophers to help people understand things, right? But then, what is good is philosophy. What would anybody want it for? Why would anybody buy it, so to speak, if it didn't help you? Uh, if it didn't help you understand things, right? So this is non-commercial philosophy doesn't help you understand. Non-commercial literature doesn't have a story you could under you could uh, you know follow and enjoy. Non-commercial music is music without a, a melody. Um, so all of these people, their pet versions of the their artworks or their of their what they do in their profession, is a non-commercial, non-sellable uh, version of what's in the field, and it's non-sellable because it gets rid of the very aspect that's of value uh, in it to people. And so maybe um, by extension, we're supposed to understand. Well, I mean. We'll leave it to think about what, by extension, can we understand about what it is to be non-commercial in that in that respect. Uh, let's see. Carrie Ann um, has an interesting comment about Lillian's motive here. Uh, she quotes a passage, uh, in particular, where Reardon, in I, I'm pretty sure this is from Reardon's perspective. He had no right to accuse her. He thought, or ever, even ever to break the bond. Uh, she wanted nothing. She was a woman of honor in their marriage. She wanted nothing material from him. So it's worth noting that Reardon himself thinks she doesn't seem to want anything material. Right. Uh, and so then the question is, what is it? And th there, there have been more comments about uh, she wants some kind of recognition. Um, and that's I think a possibility. That's she does seem to kind of bask in uh, her role in this little subculture that she's got going, right? But, but then what are we to make of uh, the, the issue of the bracelet? Well, I'm, Surely, yeah, I mean... Surely uh, having a bracelet would be a... A, a diamond bracelet is a, is a, is a prestigious so. kind of thing. And, and her... Um, I mean, I guess, I guess it's consistent with that to some extent. Um, but uh, 
is it what's going on here is the idea that the bracelet is of non-commercial value because if people like to look at her wear it and how does that square with the uh reared metal bracelet uh, being valued mm -hmm. that's something that's supposed to be mere merely commercially valuable uh and therefore not uh, of interest to Lillian. Uh, but surely a bracelet is is commercially valuable. It's, it's worth a lot more money. Uh, Reardon metal is apparently very cheap to make. So what's going on there? And uh, Carrie Ann has another comment. Uh, it's more than social status that Lillian wants. She wants Hank around and uh, around in order to slight and belittle him in sneaky ways to make herself feel and look superior. Now that's interesting because uh, that certainly doesn't sound like a commercial motive, and it would it would help explain a bit about her reaction to the Reardon metal bracelet uh, by not expressing interest in it. She's that's certainly an opportunity uh, for her to slight and belittle him. Though it, it would be, it's odd uh, to consider wanting to slight and belittle somebody as a non-commercial uh, motive that would be so worthy of respect. Uh, is that what she would admit to being her motive? Is that what uh, motive the other people at this party would admit to being their motive? Yeah, I mean, I think we're meant to be questioning, right, whether the non-commercial is, uh, is something worthy of respect. Um, mm. And, you know, Francisco says, you mean your problem is they don't sell like soap and so forth. But, yeah, there is still the question not just of how we are the audience meant to conceive of it, or um, but how Lil Lillian uses this phrase non-commercial. What would she say if you asked her, um, well, isn't the diamond commercial? And I guess she, uh, I don't know what she would say. I guess she would acknowledge that it is. But um, on the other hand, who is there at the party who does value the bracelet? I mean, apart from Reardon, of course. Uh, and is she one of the commercialists or is she one of the non-commercialists? And of course, I'm, t I'm talking about Dagny. And Dagny gives up her diamond bracelet uh, so that she can get this. Can, people said they couldn't hear me for a moment. Can everybody hear me again now? I was just adjusting one of the settings. I'm pretty sure I'm sending sound now. Can people hear Greg? If you did, you can't yeah. hear him. You, you good. Thanks, Robert. Okay, so yeah, we're back up. I'm back up. I just changed something about my mic because I thought it was going to over deviate. Okay. Um, yeah. So let's let's move on from this this uh, issue of the title. Unless anybody does anyone have anything else they want to add about the title? What's commercial and what's non-commercial? And, and we've noted some puzzles about this, like um, Lillian's wanting the bracelets, um, Scudder's and Pritchard's wanting their canapes and so forth. <laughs> Oh. Uh, all suggest, you know, some kind of interest in the, in at least, you know, things that money can buy. One other thing that maybe is a good segue from this topic to the next one, Greg, is the issue of the things about the party that there are to enjoy. Um, because, of course, we get a conversation between Dagny and Reardon where Dagny reminds Reardon or tells Reardon for the first time about, uh, you know, her view of parties. And she's, of course, thinking about her ball, which we read about in an earlier chapter. And he's found himself enjoying some of the very same things about the party that uh, Dagny did, though perhaps for slightly different kinds of reasons, the lights, the flowers, the colors, things like this. And yeah. what uh, Dagny had remarked to her mother back in that scene was that uh, she thinks, you know, she wonders if people at her ball uh, have it backwards, if they think that the lights and the colors and the flowers and the glamour of the ball are going to make them be romantic, them as people, as opposed to the other way around. And we get the idea that Dagny thinks celebrations are worth celebrating only if you have something to celebrate. So uh, it, the flowers and the lights and so forth all need to be some kind of expression of that underlying uh, character state or your values. Uh, and so there's a, there's a, an issue raised there as to what is the proper relationship between the, the material expressions and the spiritual underlying values. And 
she could be asking the same question about the people at this party. And we, in fact, we see that the people at this party have some kind of issue uh, with regard to their relationship between the two, though the, just exactly what it is, is, is perhaps too early to speculate about. Robert mentions another instance of the non-commercial language being used. Um, Philip says Bearden wouldn't be interested in something that's non-commercial. And I think that goes with th this general point of his family both insists that they owe, he owes them the non-commercial, uh, or he thinks that that's how they, you know, that, that he owes them the non-commercial and their right to complain that he won't, uh, is not doing enough to have a life with them unrelated to business. And yet also, particularly as in this, this um, passage with Philip that uh, Robert uh, refers to, but I think also with Lillian, they tend to kind of pride themselves or, or enjoy having it over on him that the only things he likes are commercial and these other things, oh, Henry, you wouldn't like that. Uh, it's a strictly non-commercial thing. Like you might, uh, it, it's a kind of patronizing attitude they're taking to him. And that maybe goes with the idea that they want to have, uh, someone said Lillian wants to have power over Reardon or uh, Carrie Ann said wants to make Reardon look... Um, well, she wants to make herself look or feel superior by uh, contrast to Reardon by putting him in undignified situations, and maybe this is another another sort of example of that. Well, let's let um, oh let me actually before we um, Robert likes my library. Thanks, Robert. Um, before we move on to to some of uh, the, the issues about the window. Um, while we're talking about all these non-commercial sorts here, um, let me mention uh, Will brought up uh, Ralph Eubanks' comment that um, Balfe. About yeah, sorry, yeah, I said Balfe, and it's it's Ralph or it's Balfe, damn it. Uh, Balfe Eubanks' comment um, about Reardon that Lillian repeats back to him that he's like a what is it, Ben? He's like a a crusader with a um, plume of uh, with a with a, a factory's um, the smoke coming out of a chimney as his plume, something like that, um, and and uh, so so Lillian quotes back this um, this this image to Reardon as a funny thing that Balfe Bank said, and Will uh, paused over that because he said it, it sounds like a kind of thing an admirer of Reardon's might say. But but Eubanks isn't an admirer of Reardon's, and I think it's pretty clear from the from the chapter that he's not. So, any thoughts on why he would say this? Is this an admiring thing? And Greg, would you, what page is that on? Oh, it's you towards to the end. Page? It's I think it's when Reardon comes into Lillian's bedroom and she's making small talk with him. We're doing this a little more informally than we do the ones that we do on Tuesday nights, so uh, I don't have all the page numbers marked. But if anyone else has got the scene uh, near to hand, you can pull it up. Anyway, any thoughts from anybody on why he would say such a thing and what the significance of it is? Is it intended as a kind of uh, a rare positive thing he's saying about Reardon or, or what? It's on page 157 of the Standard Edition. Balf Eubanks said a very funny thing about you. He said, you're a crusader with a factory's chimney sp smoke for a plume. I'm glad you don't there, like Francisco Danconia. I can't stand him either. Yeah, well, that's the other thing. They, someone asked about that, too, uh, as something we might talk about, why, she, why they have that in common. Um, uh, the taunting of Hank is inconsequential. So... I mean, I think it's intended as a kind of sarcastic remark, um, and it's, it's a kind of silly image, a crusader with a factory's chimney smoke for a plume. But also, Eubank isn't the kind of person who would have a positive view of crusaders, right? Uh, he doesn't, uh, and it's not just that he would be, maybe would be against religion, we don't know if he would be or not. But think of the kinds of things that Eubank, um, that Eubank, uh, 
writes about, you know, the heart is a milkman. He's, he's, uh, he, he, things that are heroic are laughable to him, right? And he thinks they're laughable to all of us in our age. They're ridiculous. Uh, happy endings and plots and heroism and dashing. So, so a crusader to him would be an image of some, you know, anachronistic, melodramatic, uh, ridiculous thing that an immature person would like, but that us us more sophisticated folks know is silly. It's laughable to us now. So I think um, for Hubank, it's a it's a, a belittling description. And yet, yeah, there I, is some. Th- Go ahead. I put this. I put this in the same category as Lillian always ta- talking about Reardon as being a Puritan, playing yes, the role was, of the Puritan. I was going to bring that up too. So, yeah, so, so this is something that Eubank disparages that he thinks is funny or makes light of, right? And he's trying to tear down things like that. And there, But there is something real that's important to Reardon that is there. Reardon is someone who takes seriously doing what's right. And they take this with Lillian's comment about him being a Puritan, right? Um, uh we see Reardon in the very beginning concerned about his moral purity, not in a kind of neurotic way, but concerned. He wants to do the right thing. And if he finds that he doesn't in this instance want to do the thing that he thinks is right, that concerns him and he wants to try to solve it. He's someone who takes being good seriously, who demands a lot from himself. And Lillian makes light of uh, or treats as a kind of humorous and and uh, uh, a source of trouble, that fact about him. Earlier, she says, ah, Robert's just, just saying it right as I was about to say it. Earlier in, in chapter two, she says, but you're wrong. Henry is a saint. That's the problem, right? And so here again uh, with Crusader. Now, now, Jean says she took Crusader in a negative way. And I think there are two kinds of ways you might take Crusader in a negative way. Uh, in In particularly recently, as people have become... Um, more sensitive about, or anyway, more concerned about issues of one culture dominating another, and uh, people have seen the Crusaders as Western imperialism and so forth. You you might think of the Crusaders, some people think of the Crusaders as the bad guys in the Crusades, and, you know, let's not debate the merits of the Crusades. It doesn't seem like either side in them was uh, was such great shakes. But you you could be using Crusader in a negative sense because you think the Crusaders are the bad guys in the Crusade. Uh, but the other way in which you might be using Crusader in a negative sense, which is, I think, more what, how, so I interpret Eubanks' remark, is using Crusader in this generic sense, not literally as the people who went on the Crusades you know, for the Catholic Church, but as somebody who is fighting for a moralistic cause, right? Fighting for a principle, and and uh, and going uh, the distance for a principle, but that whole thing is to be mocked, to be silly, uh, is not serious. It's not something we can regard as uh, as right. It's uh, quixotic to pick up on Carrie Ann's uh, remarks. She says it's in Don Quixote's version of it, and I think that's right. There's a kind of ridiculousness or, of, of about crusades, at least as Eubank portrays it, and on Eubank's view, right, where uh, there is no danger to life. He's tilting at steel mills, yes. Okay, um, so shall we move on to the um, to the issue of the the window? Yeah, uh, I mean, so we talked about this scene a little bit already. We talked about it primarily as uh, uh, to focus the interaction between Reardon and Francisco because Reardon. Uh, looks out the window at his party and compares what's going on outside to what's going on inside and has this feeling. And then later on, uh, Francisco makes an entree to the conversation by trying to name both what he was feeling and thinking. Uh, And we talked about that because first it gave us an idea of uh, Francisco's view of what makes the the meaning of being a man in contrast to all the intellectuals at the party. and it shows that there's some common recognition of the situation between both Francisco and Reardon. And I mean, I think there are people who were wondering in the comments thread earlier, what is the main action of this chapter? Uh, and I, mean, I think that the main thing that happens in this chapter is that Francisco and Reardon 
uh, meet each other and get to know each other better and have you know make surprising discoveries about each other because of that. There doesn't have anyway, to be precisely one main action of each chapter. Sure, sure. Um, I would say that the two are the three things are the meeting of Reardon and Francisco. And if I, if I had to pick one, I would say that was the biggest. The exchange of the bracelet and Reardon's deepening understanding of Lillian. Yeah. So that's kind of the uh, the plot action that the uh, the window scene concerns. But I was interested in it because of the very particular nature of the emotion that Reardon's described as having. And we talked a little bit more about how I think there are interesting things about the relationships between uh, the feelings and, and uh, our thoughts between reason and emotion uh, being described in this chapter more generally, which we talked about last time too. But the particular kind of emotion that's happening here is very interesting. So first thing is, I'll, I'll just read for you the passage where this is described. Uh, Tonight, the shifting colors of the evening dresses drowned out the appearance of the room and gave it an air of brilliant gaiety. He liked to see people being gay, even though he did not understand his particular manner of enjoyment. He looked at the flowers, at the sparks of light on the crystal glasses, at the naked arms and shoulders of the women. So all the same stuff that Dagny uh, appreciated about uh, her ball. But here's the part where it's where there's a difference, I think. There was a cold wind outside, sweeping empty stretches of land. He saw the thin branches of a tree being twisted, like arms waving in an appeal for help. The tree stood against the glow of the mills. He could not name his sudden emotion. He had no words to state its cause, its quality, its meaning. Some part of it was joy, but it was solemn, like the act of burying one's head. He did not know to whom. And so one question you want to think about here is, well, to whom is he burying his head, if that's, what's, if that's really what's going on here. But it's, it's worth thinking about what kind of feeling is this, and uh, do we have a name for it? Does anybody else ever experience it? And what's responsible for it in this situation? And uh, I mean, I think that a lot of people can identify with this to some extent, um, if, and we just had a hurricane go by here and I spent the day stocking up, uh, to make sure we'd have enough food to eat in case the power went out and, uh, did nothing really happen turned out, but you know, when this kind of thing happens and you've got all your food stocked up, you know, there's a kind of, there's a kind of coziness associated with it. Uh, you get to see the storm outside, inside, it's you know, the weather outside is frightful and inside the fire is so delightful kind of kind of feeling. I think a lot of people identify with that. And that's maybe part of what's going on here for Reardon because he's noting the contrast between the coziness inside and the, 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 the wind whipped uh, plane outside. But that's not all there is for Reardon because we also get the fact that it's in contrast to the glow of the mills. And of course, the mills are his and he built them and they're also what's made possible this house and this party and that's maybe an element of the situation that most people wouldn't identify if they've never built mills or you know pay, uh, made possible a, a house and a party uh, by virtue of them so some part of it was joy but it was solemn like the act of bearing one's head and he did not know to whom so of course we then later get francisco saying more about why he's feeling this and we talked about this a little bit already last time but here he says uh, you stood here and watched the storm with the greatest pride one can ever feel because you were able to have summer flowers and half-naked women in your house on a night like this in demonstration of your victory over the storm and if it weren't for you most of uh, those who are here would be left helpless at the mercy of that wind in the middle of some such plane and so uh, one thing i think is interesting about the feeling that Francisco is describing here is not just coziness. It's it's something more, uh, something to do with the victory over the storm. And I think it's interesting also that when Reardon describes it to himself, he thinks of it in this kind of quasi-religious way, as uh, like uh, bearing his head and. Uh, you know, it's solemn, like the act of burying one's head. 
And uh, I guess um, before I say anything more about this, I just, uh, is there anybody want to comment on this? Does anybody have any idea what's, what could be going on here? To whom is he bearing his head? Have you heard anything like this kind of uh, emotion described anywhere else? Have you experienced it? Do you know of other people who've reported having experienced it? Greg, do you, you want to jump in at all before? Well, just Francisco himself puts a word to it, right? He, tell, he said, you stood here feeling uh, pride. And what was the exact quote? The mo this kind of profound sense of pride, right? That the greatest pride one can ever feel. Right. So yeah. that doesn't tell us exactly, it doesn't tell us literally who he's uh, bearing his head to or bowing his head to, but it, it's, um, it's naming it's the hint. emotion that he's trying to um, that he's trying to say, but it's got joy, but it has solemnity to it. And I mean, I think the the obvious answer, and it's largely right, is that he's um, he's bowing his head, or is it bearing? What's the word? That, what's the verb? Bearing is that you take your hat off, in other words, uh, to himself, right? And pride is is an emotion you have with respect to yourself, but what. Francisco says is um, the meaning of being a man, right? So he's not just affirming himself, Hank Reardon in particular. It's not just that he has pride in himself, Hank Reardon, the guy who made these mills and so forth, although I think he does have that, and that's a big part of it. What he has is, is pride in the human race, pride in human beings, that we can do this, and then uh, pride in particular in himself as the human being who who did this in this particular case. But I think you can feel this same kind of thing if you didn't make the mills and, and make the house possible. When you see a tremendous human achievement, uh, you can think, you know, wow, this is what it means to be a man. And whatever things in your own life are examples of your being a man, of your living up to human nature, I think power your ability to do that. And it's all the more powerful, I think, in the case of your own achievement, uh, but I, I think it's a, it's a kind of species pride as well as an individual pride that he's experiencing. Yeah, uh, uh, Jesse online says there's something about it that seems like praying. Uh, and I mean, solemnity I, there's definitely is the word we get used. Solemnity, bearing your head. Uh, these are definitely religious uh, images, though it's it's not typical that you would pray to yourself uh, or have kind of religious reverence toward yourself. But there's something there's something uh, in common with that, and so this gets me then to the kind of comparative philosophy point that I wanted to make uh, before. And I wrote a blog post about this at one point. If anybody is interested, uh, at we the, should uh, share that on premises. the on the page. Um, we'll do the second, but we should share it on the uh, right. On this yeah. Page. And one of the things that I wanted to compare Reardon's emotion here to was the. The, the, the feeling that is sometimes called the sublime uh, and compare and contrast uh, the, the kind of feeling being discussed. So this is, a, this is a feeling you get a lot of commentary on coming from uh, philosophers in uh, the 19th century, mid to late 19th century, and especially upon reflection on kind of romantic literature and poetry, uh, Wordsworth and uh, and the like, and, which is typically nature poetry, where the the poets or the authors are commenting on the the the, the vastness of nature, uh, and they feel a kind of terror toward it. But at the same time, in feeling this terror, there is a certain kind of pleasure. Uh, there's a certain kind of pleasure coming from the fact that, well, you, you're able to contemplate how vast nature is and how terrible nature is, but in reading a poem about it or, or, or looking at it from a certain vantage point, you're detached from it and you're sort of disinterested from it. And there are a number of philosophers in this period who had a lot to say about it, such as Kant and, and Burke. Burke, in particular, had a whole uh, book that he wrote about the nature of the sublime. And one of the things that's, I think, very interesting about it is that, uh, so you do get the sense that uh, the, the people in this period, the romantics, 
realized that part of the what was great, what was what was uh, distinctive about this emotion is that you are separate from nature enough so that you're not terrified. Uh, and there is a certain kind of pleasure in that. Just sort of like in drama, there's a certain kind of uh, pleasure in catharsis where you see conflict. Uh, and you, ordinarily you see one person in conflict with another. It's not a pleasurable kind of thing, but when you're in, when you're reading it in a story, there's something more pleasurable about it. Likewise with the, the terror of nature. And what's I think really interesting is that you didn't have anybody experiencing or reflecting on this emotion until the 19th century. Um, before that, nature was just terrible. Uh, and if you look at this blog post that I wrote, um, I give examples of like the, speaking of Puritans, um, the pilgrims coming to Massachusetts Bay Colony for the first time, they, they weren't wowed by the awe-inspiring beauty of nature or anything. They just thought it was a satanic wilderness. And the first visitors to Pike's Peak uh, thought that it was, you know, awful and, and, uh, and uh, you know, scary and um, they didn't want to stay there for very long. So the, the fact that you get this kind of sense of uh, the beauty of nature has something to do with being far enough removed from it that you can that you can feel safe from it even though it's terrible. And the fact that anybody was ever so removed enough from it to feel that security, I think, has a lot to do with the fact that the Industrial Revolution happens, as Robert points out. And so, I mean, I think arguably you wouldn't have gotten romantic reverence for the sublime were it not for the Industrial Revolution, though, interestingly, then the romantics and the philosophers who interpret them, uh, they interpret this kind of emotion in these kind of religious terms. They, they say, uh, we have some, you know, access to the divine when we are experiencing the sublime. Uh, and so there is that religious aspect to it for them. But, you know, one question to think about is, uh, uh, well, what is it that made this feeling possible in the first place? What is it that made that separation possible in the first place? If it was the equivalent of Reardon's Mills, is the is the kind of quasi-religious aspect of that feeling truly a sign of access to the divine or of something else? Yeah, and th this I think is a really uh, interesting and, and novel observation uh, of yours, Ben. The the that the 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 feeling that we're getting here that Francisco takes as this is when you appreciate the meaning of being a man, this, this perspective on nature and the contrast of nature uh, having become a topic of philosophical reflection and indeed a, 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 an ecstatic experience that seems to be new or at least newly striking to people uh, around the time of industrialization I think is really interesting. I, I doubt that Rand had that specifically in mind when she wrote the scene, that she thought of that historical point, although it's possible she did. Um, but I, I think it, it that the the fact that there is that historical point underscores the the thematic point she's making, and uh, and that point is that there's a, a kind of appreciation of humanness, a kind of species pride that it's possible to have, and that's a part of this experience of the sublime, and um, and that is a one of the As Ben, as you pointed out in the in on Tuesday, this you know now when you appreciate the meaning of being a man stands in tremendous contrast to the uh, the view of the society's leaders at the party. Right, that man is a miserable thing with pretensions and so forth. Um, the non-commercial, as it seems, uh, at least from the chapter's perspective, view of man, whereas this pr proud. Um, sublime view of men that's connected to an appreciation of the sublime in nature is, if it is indeed connected to uh, industry, a commercial you know view of men, or a view of men that comes out of or is connected to uh, industry, commerce, and and so forth. All right. So and by the way, was, this is not. Oh yeah, go ahead, Ben. This is not the last that we shall see uh, in this chapter, or sorry, in this book on this topic. Um, in fact, in just a few chapters coming up, 
I don't think I'm giving away any spoilers to say that Dagny uh, and Reardon go on a trip together and they're driving through the countryside and just pay attention to the way they both talk about the drive. This is when they're yeah, in the on this, I should say on this issue of um, that Ben you were, were stressing through the session last time of the relation between emotion and reason or between desire and reason, which is how it's, um, it's mostly cast in this. I mean, those are related, but it, it's mostly the language of desire. Um, I, you know, backed off a bit from interpreting, uh, keeping the focus on that and interpreting some scenes in this chapter. And I, I don't um, think that I do think it's a significant theme that's introduced in this chapter, but there are some chapters that have a kind of self-contained theme where everything uh, in the chapter, I think, is reflecting of that theme or all the main events. In this case, I think um, th this theme of the relation between desire and reason doesn't have that special connection to this chapter, but we do have this beginning of the chapter in the way you said, really introducing that theme. And it's a theme that is now a real undercurrent in the next several chapters. And we have in particular in chapter eight, and we'll talk a lot about it when we get there, a real summing up of that theme um, in, in some of Daphne's thoughts there. And so I think there's a kind of arc that we're seeing the beginning of uh, in, in this chapter. Uh, we've had like little premonitory notes of it sounded before, but this chapter I think gives us a you know first full blast of something that really comes to... Uh, uh, to our first kind of philosophical statement of it in chapter eight. And I also think that it's closely connected to this question about the commercial versus the non-commercial, which is a code word for the connection between uh, the material and the spiritual. And I think that this question about the relation between uh, reason and emotion has a lot to do with the book's ultimate resolution of that other topic. Yeah, absolutely. And it has a lot to do with some of the issues from chapter seven that there's starting to be some discussion of uh, of online, the, the scene of the bomb in the diner and, and the scene with Dr. Stadler. We won't say more about that now to not preempt uh, Tuesday, but, you know, uh, there's already been a little discussion of this on in Facebook, and I hope there'll be a little more. Um, all right, let's move on. What, there were a few other topics we had w wanted to touch on that came up on on Facebook and if you guys on the the chat have further topics uh, let us know so one there's um, the conversation Daphne overhears um, there are a few interesting aspects to this conversation right oh, there's an old woman who's afraid of the night and this is just a, a nice every night she feels like the sun's not going to come up again and so she can't sleep until she begins to see uh, see the sunrise. This is, you know, another way of, of indicating that the feeling that Eddie has about twilight, that something's going out of the world, that the world is dying, a way of indicating the kind of pervasiveness of this feeling, this remark of this woman. And the world seems like it's going wrong. And it seems like it's, it, it seems this way to many of the characters we're now learning. It's not just Eddie who's noticed this. Um, but there's a kind of feeling of unease and dread and like something's going going wrong with the world. In some sense, it's dying. And we'll get more commentary on that in Chapter 7. Uh, in this same context, we learn of Ragnar Danestjult, right? This is the first mention of this character. Um, not that much significant about him yet, but it's presented as a, uh, you know, he's a character we'll hear more about later, but it's presented as a kind of sign of the death or degradation of the society that now we have pirates uh, on the seas, and not just on the seas, but seemingly in Delaware Bay, and nobody can catch him. And we learn that, um, we learn that, uh, that he went to school in America at Patrick Henry University, which is a school that we know what other things about. We know two other things about Patrick Henry University. Uh, precisely, I think, or three, two or three, depending on how you count. Well, we know that Francisco went there. Yeah, we know Francisco went there. Uh, we learned that from Chapter 5, the flashback, and we've met now um, another character who, who teaches there, right, which is uh, which is Pritchett. Um, so I think that's, an, that's, you know, well, we'll see if there's more more of a connection there. 
but that's we also know that it's fact. in cleveland and we know that it's in cleveland yes so that's a third thing um so it's case western. cleveland i don't think it's meant to be case western exactly but um it's a ask some case western alums yes and, and stadler taught there um uh yes we already know that stadler taught there or we learned that in chapter seven brian but i don't think it's a uh, spoiler to say it now. So um, more on more on this a little bit uh, on Tuesday. When we talk about chapter seven. We're starting to see some connections to uh, 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 from Patrick Henry University. We also get a legend about John Galt. Right. Um, the, there are going to be a few of these in the book. Uh, we get a a legend about John Galt, or we get somebody claiming she knows who John Galt is. Right, and this is the Atlantis one, as I recall. Right, uh, he's yes. a, was a, and a rich which is guy. The, the first time we hear mention of Atlantis. In this book. Yes, and for those of you who saw the little promo video Ben and I did, making efforts to capture a lot of the spirit without giving a lot of spoilers, we suggested that Atlantis is an important symbol. And if you look at the table of contents, of course, it's, it's the name of one of the chapters. So uh, John Galt is mentioned uh, in connection with Atlantis. And interestingly, Francisco says that that woman doesn't know it, but she's telling the truth. Now, we don't know what's going on with Francisco generally, and he's a kind of enigmatic character, but that's a weird thing to say. So that's an interesting development in this chapter. Since we've talked a little bit about comparative philosophy already, I should ask you this question. Do you think it's at all significant that most of what we know about Atlantis, we get through one particular philosopher? Um, I'm not sure. I thought, so for people who don't know, Atl the, the story of Atlantis is, is the original primary Greek source or way we have it in English from Greek is in Plato. Uh, where he tells the story of Atlantis. And I imagine Ayn Rem would have known that. Um, she never, never talks about it. But Atlantis is a kind of more general cultural symbol. And it's also a symbol that was used by a number of philosophers. So Francis Bacon um, has a kind of uh, fiction story about people who go to Atlantis and, and what the people in Atlantis are like uh, and so forth. Uh, oh, hi, Will. I, we, we talked about uh, Balf Eubanks' comment that you raised earlier. Um, so, At the same time, the way that Atlantis is described by the uh, person about, speaking about the legend is as mm -hmm. follows. Atlantis was a place where hero sp spirits lived in a happiness unknown to the rest of the earth, a place which only the spirits of heroes could enter, and they reached it without dying because they carried the secret of life within them. Atlantis was lost to mankind even then. I don't know if she was thinking about Plato, but I mean, certainly describing Atlantis in kind of platonic terms, uh, like the realm of the forms or something like that. Well, but Plato himself describes it in not like the, the platonic forms, but in this kind of this lost, better place um, language. So it's... it's um, it's in keeping with how Plato describes it, but it's also in keeping with the way it's been used as a symbol uh, in Bacon and so forth. Um, so I don't, I don't have very mu much to say about that. I, Plato is a philosopher who is very interested in ideals, right? Um, and yet who has a, a view of ideals that's very different from Rand's own. And uh, Atlantis, the, the functioning of Atlantis as a symbol in the story is interesting. We will... Um, We'll have to, uh, you know, say more about this when we get to it. But I mean, the, the, there's the idea in Plato, right, of somebody who comes from a worse realm into a better realm and then tries to bring other people to it and can't or has difficulty. Think of the, the guy coming out of and going back into the cave. And if you think of the John Galt legend that we were uh, shown here um, and some of the other John Galt legends were shown later, you might think there's some commonality there. Um, so that's, that's an interesting point. Um, we haven't actually, is this the, the first, this is the first legend also. We haven't yes. heard any other John Galt legends. This is the yet. first time somebody claims to, to know who John Galt is. Um, we get some others later. I don't think that's too big a spoiler to say. Um, and... 
Let's see other other points about the the um, So yeah, uh, Nancy. What about the look of uh, being asked, chained? <laughs> that's what I was about to bring up. Nancy had asked about the look of being chained, the most feminine of all aspects that Dagny has because she has this uh, this one bracelet on her wrist. So does anybody have thoughts about what's feminine about being chained? If, if anything. Not just feminine, but the most feminine of all aspects. Well, I mean, you get... We're going to have to induce what we can about the novel or Rand's view of sexuality uh, as we go forward. But even in this chapter, you get... Um, when Dagny's being described in ways that are meant to bring out her sexuality, right? Um, they they all have a dominant, submissive kind of uh, kind of structure to them. So she stands taut, right, um, and uh, and she looks strong, but there's something about her strength that's a challenge to someone else's superior strength. Uh, so that there's the idea that she is this powerful person, but who's capable of, uh, you know, uh, is on the lookout for someone who could dominate her and, uh, and has found no one who could notice this about her. No one even notices this, this fact about that this is expressed in her posture and in her way of being, of course, except Francisco when she was younger. Um, and, um, Jesse's saying, in theory, women award men that power, so it's not necessarily submissive in the traditional sense. I think, I think that's right. I mean, there's a traditional sense of submissiveness that being chained might uh, might um, go along with. Think of you know Princess Leia in uh, in the last uh, the last of the proper Star Wars movies, um, and uh, with Jabba, right? And um, so. There's that kind of traditional view of femininity being chained. But then Rand seems to have a kind of different take on this. It's a take where there's a, a powerful woman. Um, there's a powerful woman who uh, could squash 10 of, you know, normal men. Um, but there's still a respect in which she wants to be overcome or dominated or is, is capable of that with the right kind of man. And uh, I think that tension is, is, you know, something she's playing with. And we've already seen that with Francisco. We'll see how Daphne's romantic life develops, but we could already see in this chapter uh, and a little bit the last, some real heat between her and Reardon. And, um, you know, we'll see where that goes. Will says uh, he started to say something about Wonder Woman and philosophy. I guess there's a, a book in the uh, there are a couple of series of pop culture and philosophy books, and I guess there's a Wonder Woman one, and it looks like Will uh, is partway through writing uh, his post when he posted it, so maybe he'll uh, let us know what the contributor uh, that he's talking about had to say about Wonder Woman. All right, but I don't have too also, much... Also, Carrie Ann's uh, comment is worth making. Oh, what did she say? Uh, to be chained is to be connected slash bound to another. On the female side, it means having been conquered. Is that uh, is that uh, what Rand is implying here? I don't see. Uh, I don't see that comment of Perry's. I wonder. Oh, uh, so yeah, the I see it on. Something. I don't see it on the com I'm, comment system, I'm but I see it, it on the live feed. So, Pooja, if you're so watching, this is another case. another, another uh, it's not we, We've got this new format we're using to look at the comments and we're we're testing it. So Carrie Ann says, yeah, to be claimed is to connect it or bound to another. On the female side, it means having been conquered. Yeah, I don't... I mean, I think it's... Um, the sense of chain in which you would chain a prisoner or, a ca or, or someone you'd conquered, I don't think it's like there's a chain, there's a connection here. Someone online mentioned like a supply chain and I just... You don't... You don't use the 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 form of the word chained to mean that. Like you know, uh, if I want to talk about how connected, uh, how well the internet connection is working, I don't say Ben and I are chained on the internet. Chained means um, 
in bondage. And uh, I think that's how the word is meaning here. Um, and uh, and I think the significance of it is that it's conquered. Yeah, conquered uh, in a way. And there's a... Uh, it's a part of Dagny's sex appeal of the way she expresses uh, her femininity, whether this is a part of femininity as such or just Dagny's, you know, take on being a woman or Rand's take on what it is for Dagny to be a woman, that she is conquerable. And uh, there is but, but quite a challenge to conquer. Um, we have symbol of her worship of a man, of a bond to him and so forth. Um, Jesse says she literally chained herself to Hank and that she took uh, took his chain. And I think it's significant that in that scene she acts uh, without any kind of conscious intention. She just finds herself doing it, right? So it's not... And I think in general we could see here Daphne is um, being driven in part by what Hank means to her and what the medal means to her in coming to the party... In, um, in noticing him right away, in kind of hiding the fact that she noticed him right away. And uh, her, she's ahead of you know, her own uh, realizations about that, uh, or maybe she's a little afraid to, to admit to herself, or she hasn't realized the extent to which that's driving her. And part of what's driving her here is, I think, a hatred of Lily and, and, uh, and a real appreciation of Hank that intensifies the anger at Lillian. Um, but she does, you know, in that sense, take Hank's chain, and that's a symbol of that. And she wants then to be seen in it, right? And it's a more clear-cut case of being chained than the the diamond bracelet, which just suggested chains by um, means, uh, you know, abstractly as a single thing around her wrist. So I wonder what, I mean, what do people out there think about this? What do you, do you agree with this view of uh, the relationship between the sexes? Do you disagree uh, if so, why? Uh, there's certainly, I think, a lot of people today who do disagree with this. No question about that. Um, I, I, you know, I think most of the feminist readers of this chapter are going to be horrified by that kind of language, uh, way of describing the relationship between men and women. Um, at the same time, it's it's worth thinking about. Uh, what kind of view of men and women uh, Rand is also portraying in other aspects of the book. Uh, there was uh, somebody who wrote a comment today on uh, the, uh, the kind of uh, lingering questions comment thread, I think it was Iris, who said that when she first read this novel, after the, uh, she was surprised by how after the, the sex scene between uh, Francisco and Dagny in the in the previous chapter, uh, that it wasn't followed by a chapter where Dagny was just worrying about uh, pregnancy and uh, other ill consequences of uh, her sexual nature, and because that's what she uh, Iris had come to expect from the literature of the period, and that this was a that this was a kind of a breath of fresh air in its very rebellious view about sexuality. And of course, about um, <clears throat> about female sexuality and about women. And Dagny is uh, Dagny is pretty far from uh, being a uh, the ideal of someone who <coughs> thinks women should be barefoot and pregnant, right? And she's written and, by. And it, it's significant here that she's written by a female author. And here, Will's Will's point um, about Wonder Woman, which I see he's he's now finished, uh, is that. Um, when Mars, when the original author, I guess, Marston was writing the stories, well, I don't know who who wrote Wonder Woman and the history of the Wonder Woman story. So, I'm guessing that the original was the original cartoonist a woman, and then it was um, changed, and then, then later on, men took over writing it. I, I don't know, um, but in if that's the the case with what Will is saying, it's significant anyway that the original authors had uh, some kind of submissiveness uh, being part of the character, and then later that was no longer seen as part of a strong, powerful, heroic woman. And so there does seem to have been a little uh, a little shift here. Um, in 
I, I noticed this, you know, male and female perspectives on this was an interesting thing also when there's been now a long discussion online about the slap sequence in which Francisco slaps Daphne. And somebody pointed out to me that, um, I don't think this is universally true, but it, it's true of a lot of the people participating in that uh, in that uh, discussion, that more of the people who find that scene uncomfortable or uh, um, aren't able to reconcile how a, po- a character that's being portrayed positively could behave as Francisco does there, more of them were men than were women, and more of the people who were um, finding the scene kind of sexy or interesting or inclined to, to, to easily take the perspective that Dagny takes on Francisco's action uh, were women. Now, I think there are a lot of women who wouldn't easily take the perspective that Daphne takes, uh, you know, not not even if they were in Daphne's situation, but reading the book, um, and certainly um, you know, the general feminist perspective on it would be very negative. But um, I think... But I should is... also add, in connection with the point I was making before, that uh, just like... Uh, well... So somebody who's going to have trouble with the slap scene is probably also going to have trouble with the chain scene. Um, but at the same time, what what is Francisco slapping her about? Uh, she's made this joke about, uh, should I just pretend to not be very smart so that I can be popular and not bother getting good grades? I mean, he's slapping her because she's joking about making herself into a female doormat. And so again, if if that and that's the wider context of this scene and the the bigger conflict between the two of them that the author wants to emphasize. And so just like I was saying before, uh, you have to take those together with each other and think the author seems to have this this one view uh, about uh, male female relations that people find repugnant. But on the other hand, she has this other view that not as many people do. Is it possible to hold both of these views consistently, or are they are they inconsistent with each other? And she just doesn't realize it. It's an artifact of the period. What's going on here? And this is something we're just going to have to keep an eye on as we go. We don't have, uh, you know, and and there might not be a neat answer to it. It's an issue of. Uh, interpreting both the literature and our views of psychology and also our view of how the culture has changed. Um, interesting to see. So Jean is saying that she doesn't have much trouble with the slap scene, but she does with the chain, with the chain scene. So now I think, uh, Jean, what you mean by the chain idea that you have trouble with isn't, uh, isn't that Dagny takes the chain of Reardon metal, which I don't think anybody has this issue with, um, that's clearly, at least the, the main part of the meaning of that is that she appreciates the special value of this bracelet and of Hank and of the act of his making it in a way that Hank's wife doesn't. And she's disgusted and angered by the way Hank's wife is treating it and she wants the bracelet and maybe by extension wants Hank. But um, it's the other mention of Chained uh, that um, that uh, he... Um, the most feminine of all aspects, the look of being chained from the beginning, that why is that chained? It, you know, it occurs to me also that this is, um, there's a kind of allusion back here to Lillian referring to the chain as it's the chain by which he holds us all in bondage, right? If we're going to use this bondage metaphor. And um, already when Lillian made that reference, that this is the chain by which he holds us all in bondage. Uh, we were thinking like, well, what does that mean? And in what sense is he holding people in bondage or would he want to hold people in bondage? What is the connection between them? It's meant to make us think about this um, connections and submissions and what hold people have on one another. Uh, I think that to ask questions about that, the initial uh, occurrence of that language in chapter two. And so, too, we might ask in uh, in chapter six, where we have the look of being chained as this most feminine of all aspects. Well, chained in what sense? I think it is the literal, It's what it's a metaphor to is being a captive who's in bondage, right? But um, that's a metaphor. And so what's it's a metaphor for? What is it symbolizing? Some kind of 
attachment to uh, a man or submission to a man. And so I, I think there is this idea here that femininity is about something about relation to or tie to a man or masculinity. And this is something Rand talks a little bit about in in terms of her nonfiction. And I think that's a controversial idea, more controversial probably now than it was in the late 50s. Since we had talked right, about the slap, it's worth pointing out that at the end of the session, with at the end of the party scene, we get that uh, Reardon wanted to slap Dagny's face. Yeah, but doesn't. Um, I think Carrie Ann. I think Carrie Ann might have pointed that out to us uh, the other day at the session. But it's worth re remembering it here. I think it is. It is significant, and uh, there's this kind of tension between them. Okay, so that um, I think that covers all the the topics I had on my list. Um, it, it's a, it's you could say a little bit about a few other things. There's the the exchange between Philip Scudder and Slagenhoff. I think we've said kind of all that we really need to say here about that. Oh, uh, there is one other thing, actually, I should bring up. I, oh, and, and also, um, I think the exchange between Jim and uh, Francisco is interesting. Uh, the, um, in particular, that Jim is trying to uh, hide from Francisco the fact that Francisco refused to see him, as Francisco puts it, and Jim just, uh, uh, and Francisco just comes out and says that, right? So he's not, uh, Francisco isn't going to um, play along with this attempt to cover cover up uh, the real context for the conversation. I think that's interesting. Um, two other, other uh, issues that have come up here that um, people have raised. Uh, one is in, in, a, in an email message to me, somebody asked, uh, asked something, uh, which is, uh, she's been reading, so this is Carol, I don't know, Carol, if you're online now, but uh, I'll answer you here. Uh, Carol didn't want to post this on the page because she was worried it might be a spoiler. I, I don't think it really is, though. She's noticed in, in some of Rand's nonfiction uh, that she talks about uh, logical axioms and that Leonard Peikoff does, who is a, a friend and student of Rand in, uh, and, and Eyre, um, in his book on her philosophy, and in particular the, the axiom uh, of existence exists in the law of identity, which is stated as A is A, and she's wondering if, if it's uh, when Francisco says that his teacher, Hugh Axton, taught him that um, everything is something in contrast to uh, now Simon Pritchett, who teaches that nothing is anything, is this a reference to the law of identity, to A is A, which is then the the uh, the title of part three of the novel? And I think, yes, definitely, absolutely, uh, that is what that's a reference to. And I think it's it's made clear uh, later, I don't think this gives anything away, that, that the Axton is very much interested in the law of identity, um, is interested in that there aren't contradictions, and that that's because everything is what it is. And yeah, I think that's absolutely what uh, what is being referred to in this in this scene um, the other thing I think it's worth talking a little bit about because there was a fair amount of discussion of it online when we asked what more do people want to talk about if we have a discussion of this is uh, are these various intellectuals Pritchett Eubank Liddy and so on um, modeled after real people or who would be the real life kinds of intellectuals who are like this. Uh, so there's a lot of people keep saying Kant, Kant, Kant. It's like Kant. It's like Kant. Uh, I don't think that's right. Um, not concretely. I think the, the kinds of ideas that these thinkers uh, hold, um, I think Rand would ultimately trace, um, think that that Kant's influence. I, in a kind of long-range way, was responsible for a lot of these kinds of ideas coming to prominence in the uh, in the late uh, twenty in the in the twentieth century. But uh, one, 
uh, they're significant. None of, they don't talk in a Kantian style. They don't sound like Kant. And they say things Kant would have disagreed with. Kant would not say logic is a primitive, reason is a primitive superstition. Kant claimed to be all about reason, right? Uh, Kant claimed to be all about free will. He, this is not at all Kant's style. Um, and in any case, I don't know that Rand, uh, at the time when she would have written this, already thought of Kant as a major historical villain. Uh, what I think happened is, you know, sometime in the 40s or leading, you know, in the 20s uh, and 30s, I don't think she had any particular view of Kant one way or the other. The couple of mentions of him here and there indicate that she just thought of him as a, you know, significant European uh, European philosopher, but didn't have much. He was just a name in the field to her. And in the 40s, uh, when she was writing Atlas, I think she developed a view of what the main bad philosophical ideas were uh, and the main kind of problem ideas. And then at some point in the 40s or 50s, by like 1961 or 1962, she identified uh, Kant as the kind of grandfather or source of uh, all, the main, all, the main bad, all the main ideas that she hated. But it's not clear to me that she'd even made that identification at the time when she would have written this scene. And even if she had these... Uh, what you know from her later adult mature perspective, these people would have been descendants of Kant, not not Kantians. Now, um, Carrie Ann and Will are are suggesting people who they might be. Uh, Pritchett is a lot more like B.F. Skinner. Carrie Ann says, uh, "I think that's right. Uh, I think Floyd Ferris, who we're going to get more about later, is very much like B.F. Skinner. Um, Pritchett, uh, I think, is more like." Uh, you say also the existentialist, yeah, like Bergson or Ponty or maybe Derrida or someone, some kind of, I mean, he's... The way to put together Skinner and the existentialists is with a pragmatist. James. Yeah. Uh, James? I, I, James or Dewey. And I think that's the closest that Pritchett is. But I think James more than Dewey, because so Pritchett is, is kind of openly mystical. Right, and he's described as drooling some woozy mysticism, and uh, he, where he's not using a lot of the language of science. He does say instinct, you know, once in a while, but he's not someone who's presenting himself as scientific, as a Skinner was. Will suggests like a Schopenhauer and pessimist, and I think there's there's something to the Schopenhauer connection there, um, but a kind of you know. Um, irrationalist romantic I mean even you know if you want to pick an earlier someone Rousseau even a little bit or a later kind of Rousseauvian is the, the kind of feeling you get from from Pritchett and I think Pritchett is meant to be you know a kind of pretty far parody of these types of people uh, he's meant to be kind of ridiculous rather than scary whereas Ferris again who we'll meet later is is more like um, I think Skinner, and isn't really much of an exaggeration from Skinner in his view, and people have, have you know said you know you, you no philosopher nobody would write these kind of ridiculous things like people say in this scene reason is a primitive superstition, and so forth. Um, read Beyond Freedom and Dignity, which is Skinner you know twenty years after this, uh, or, or, or Richard Gordy. Oh yeah, Richard Rorty is a good kind of Pritchett um, type. She couldn't have predicted him better. Yeah, but I mean, the one that stands out to me for saying things that are as blatant as as this in language that's not that different, uh, people will be more tractable if only we convince them that there is no reason and so forth, or reason's out of control of their life. Um, you you uh, you can't you know you can't parody Skinner when he's on a roll on this. Uh, and uh, uh, the Ayn Rand's characters have nothing on him. Will says maybe more like logical positivists than existentialists. I don't think so, because the logical positivists wouldn't have been down on logic, right? Um, they, were th that, that they were logical positivists. Um, we're, we're pro-logic, we're pro-reason, they would say, and they had a certain view of it. So um, I think just in terms of style, and uh, he's more like a continental than an analytic uh, early 20th century philosopher uh, Pritchett is. Um, and then of the literary figures, you know, I don't know of any particular type that would be an inspiration for um, Eubank. Um, I mean, Scudder is a kind of clear muck, muckraker 
sort. I think the, the kinds of uh, models for him are easy enough to come up with. Ben, do you have any ideas for Eubank or Liddy? Liddy's the kind I of mean, composer. It's significant, probably, that Balf has that name that he's kind of made up to be unconventional, which you know reminds you. Very unlike uh, I, an, an unconventionally made up. Well, name. but that's a real name. Uh, as uh, you have, like I don't know, E. E. Cummings, who wrote all of his everything in lowercase because he was trying to be different, uh, or um, I mean, you get a lot of you get me some of these a, lost generation. Beat yeah, you get people. You get parodies of these kinds of um, avant-garde in the Fountainhead, right? Where it's um, uh, um, who's the one who said uh, there is no there there, and yeah, that Lois was Cook in the parody of, of well, uh, there is no there there was uh, was uh, Stein, right? What's her name, yeah, Gertrude, Gertrude Stein. Yeah, so I think Lois Cook is a parody of Gertrude Stein, and um, and maybe James Joyce and that kind of writing. But, um, yeah, Carrie Ann says what I was about to say. I think Eubank is much more a naturalist. So he's not a, he's not a, a nonsense writer, right? Or um, uh, he's not like a Lois Cook in The Fountainhead or Gertrude Stein in real life. Or he's somebody who's, uh, you know, the heart is a milkman. It's about frustration. He's writing these kinds of, uh, the essence of life is, you know, Boring downer emotions, and I think, um, yeah, some of the kind of early twentieth century naturalist writers, um, maybe Dreiser. But also, you might I want to a little more muckrakery. Uh, go ahead, Ben. I want to uh, encourage people in in thinking about this not to assume that there is one archetype yeah. uh, that she's she's trying to parody here with whether they're the philosophers or the uh, or the the novelists or the musicians and that's one of the things that separates atlas shrugged from the fountainhead uh she was you know conscious of the fact that when she wrote the fountainhead she was uh it, it was a more naturalis naturalistic novel not just in its style, but in the way in which it was uh, more attuned to its times. It was in a definite year. Uh, you get names of definite places and products and uh, people mentioned. Um, you don't have that in Atlas Shrugged. And Atlas Shrugged is, as you've emphasized before, Greg, kind of its own new literary genre where uh, it it's much more of a fantasy and much more you know symbolic and not as uh, trying to be as faithful to the reality of mid 20th century America or anything like that. Yeah, I think that's right. And for that reason, I think it's true that we shouldn't be looking for you know, too specific a tie into other people. But I think you want to get a sense of like what kind of things could she have been attuned to in literature, in philosophy, in music that um, she's projecting off of to get to these characters. There are little bits of it, these characters. And I, I think it's right that with with Eubank, it would be more downery naturalist type novels than um, than absurdist type writing. And um, Liddy, I mean, Liddy's an interesting character, right? He's a, a composer who writes traditional melodies for for film scores, but then atonal. Um, you know, unlistenable things without melody. Oh, there's plenty of examples of composers yeah. like that, uh, like right. uh, Aaron Copeland, for instance. Uh, but, uh, and there were maybe... No, but uh, something like Rodeo, yeah. I mean, Copeland wrote stuff that was sim that was not film scores that's memorable, at least. And he also wrote a lot of atonal stuff that is not. That we don't... That's Listen not to, well, go, see, go ahead and see his opera, The Quiet Land. And see if you can get through it. Um, if I'm right. remembering the name of it correctly. So there's uh, a disrecommendation from Ben. Um, though I like his other stuff uh, more. Yeah, fanfare for the common man and so forth. Sin though um, yeah, sometimes I wonder if he's making fun of the common man with that that piece. Well, that would be a bit like um, the Balfe Eubank, a fanfare. With, right. Yeah. Since we're on the topic of Liddy, the one of the last things I wanted to mention was um, Liddy's. Uh, 
homage <laughs> to Halley's fourth concerto. And there's a question that we can ask about what happens here. And let me let me read a little bit about this. So uh, he points that his he points out that his uh, composition is on the radio. The great burst of sound was the opening chords of Halley's fourth concerto. It rose in tortured triumph, speaking its denial of pain, its hymn to a distant vision. We've heard it described that way before by Dagny. Then the notes broke. It was as if a handful of mud and pebbles had been flung at the music, and what followed was the sound of the rolling and the dripping. It was Halley's concerto swung into a popular tune. It was Halley's melody torn apart, its whole stuffed with hiccups. The great statement of joy had become the giggling of a bar room. Yet it was still the remnant of Halley's melody that gave it form. It was the melody that supported it like a spinal cord. Now, that itself, I think, is an interesting comparison. But then I think it's even more interesting when you skip a paragraph and you see the reaction of a couple of characters to this. Dagny stood staring at the room as if one sense could replace another, as if sight could wipe out sound. She moved her head in a slow circle, trying to find an anchor somewhere. She saw Francisco leaning against a column, his arms crossed. He was looking straight at her. He was laughing. Why is Francisco laughing at Dagny's reaction to this? Why, what is so significant about the, about the symphony as mangled by Liddy here? And what does this have to do with the rest of the chapter? Because I think you could argue, and I won't argue, but I think you could argue that in a way, this little passage uh, is kind of a microcosm for the whole party in a certain way, um, but I won't say I won't say why, but why might it be? And why does Francisco find it so amusing? Yeah, notice, um, I'm not sure what I think about the microcosm for the party idea, but it, it is... And that might not be the right word, but... Noticing that, um, right, this is a, 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 a piece of music that Daphne associates with Francisco. She heard it with Francisco. Uh, it was playing, I think, on their last night together. And um, that we learned about from from Chapter Five, and then she was listening to it uh, on an album when she read uh, the story about him and and Miss Vale, Mrs. Vale. Um, so, you know, Francisco well knows the significance of this. This is also an interesting little bit of an exception to the not being in time and place, because um, the way the symphony is mangled is by being swung into popular times. So you picture like Glenn Miller doing it, and the hiccups. Uh, sound like horn bursts, or you know, that's how I picture it anyway. So it's a swing time version of it, which um, does place it. Now we, you know, they were in the seventies, they did like disco Beethoven, and um, and you get and they've they've like done that. this to Rachmaninoff too with the uh, up up and away in my big balloon or whatever that tune is. Um, oh, is that what uh, what? Let's see. Huh, I hadn't yeah, thought of that as a Rachmaninoff melody. The second uh, concerto, actually. Um, I like that. But, but um, <laughs> I mean, is there anything else in this chapter which uh, was given form uh, and which the form of which supports something else like a spinal cord? Are you asking um, were those was that kind of a phrasing used or no? Or is there something uh, else to which we might apply that metaphor? Kind of, yeah. And it's well, just something I'm not sure about. what you've got in mind, but if anyone, we're actually we're well. Is anything else mind. being supported uh, in this chapter uh, by anything else? And to the to the point where it's it's been torn apart and cannibalized in the process of doing that. I mean the the I I now see what you're what you're um, what you're referring to. But I think of the spinal, I mean, the specific reference to a spinal cord as opposed to a carry and things, everything supported by Reardon, which is what I assume, Ben, you're, su you're suggesting. I, I think the spinal cord that. image, um, hmm. I think the spinal cord image is meant specifically to uh, give shape and structure to something that's distorted. And I don't have in mind... Uh, Another case of, of something that's distorted but maintaining its structure, 
Um, but there might be something I'm not seeing. Um, ben, you want to kind of close out this this thread and, and close out the broadcast? But I don't know how much more you want to say about this. I didn't have anything else I wanted to say. It would give away too much if I did. So uh, All right. we can wrap up. I think, yeah, we're just at the end of our time. So we're going to, um, we'll see all you guys on Tuesday to discuss Chapter 7. I'll be back uh, in New York, and I hope to see some of you guys who are online, uh, who I normally see in New York, there with me. And I hope to see the rest of you uh, online. And um, we're going to do, we'll do another, we're going to do these kind of supplemental broadcasts, you know, every now and again when we have either a different perspective on something. And sometimes they'll be about a particular chapter, but other times it'll just be about themes that are running uh, running through the novel. I think we're going to do one uh, the first weekend in November, we've been thinking, because we'll be in the same place then with some other friends who might want to get in on this. Okay, well, uh, I guess that's it. We're ready to sign off. Any last words, Ben? Not from me. Uh, bye, everyone. Goodbye. <laughs>